All righty. Hi, everyone, and welcome to an MSI monthly seminar. Great to have you all here. As we're coming up on a year of virtual MSI events, a lot of you are probably used to this by now, but I will briefly remind you that if you have any questions throughout the duration of the talk when we're in this Zoom webinar format, you're invited to type those into the Q&A if you would like to or make a note to yourself. And then after the talk has been delivered, when we're having our Q&A discussion portion, you're also welcome to raise your hand and share those uh, out loud. You can unmute and share those verbally too. So those are your choices, either the Q&A type feature or, or save them for the Q&A portion and feel free to ask them aloud. Uh, today, I'm really excited to welcome from the West Coast, Dr. Arash Komeli. And, but to, make, to tell you a little bit more about why we've invited him here today, I will turn that over to the person who nominated him. As per our tradition, a lot of, in fact, the vast majority of our talks are nominated by members of the MSI community. And so we're thrilled to welcome the people who do that nominating to tell you about why this talk is gonna be so exciting. I'm particularly excited about it uh, because I think it's definitely going to blow open what a lot of us traditionally think of as defining prokaryotic biology. So with that, take it away. Yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Machala. I'm a graduate student with uh, Kareen Gibbs and I'm very excited today to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Arash Kameli. So he received his uh, bachelor's degree from MIT and then went on to a PhD at UCSF where he worked with Aaron O'Shea on nuclear transport and activity of eukaryotic transcription factors. Um, and then he completed a postdoc at Caltech working with Diane Newman. And it's there that he began studying the formation of bacterial organelles known as magnetosomes that are found in magnetotactic bacteria. And you know, this is a field that I didn't know a lot about until I was following some of his work. And I think it's surprising to me how kind of widespread and ubiquitous these bacteria are. And, that a lot of us and many of you probably haven't heard of magnetotactic bacteria, don't think about bacterial organelles. Um, and so I'm, you know, I think it's really important that we all, this is something that as microbiologists, we should all kind of understand something about. Um, so since 2005, he has been a professor at UC Berkeley in the plant and microbial biology department, um, where he's actually now a colleague of my advisor, Corrine. And his group has been focused on understanding the genetic and molecular basis of magnetosome organization, as well as the biomineralization process. Um, he was also recently named a Baker Fellow to develop applications of his research towards engineering magnetotactic bacteria to mine metals from the environment, which I think is really interesting. Um, so with that, I'm really looking forward to your talk uh, and I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna first share my screen. We can see that, great. Thank you again for the invite and the introduction. Um, it's you know great to visit this community at Harvard and Boston in general because uh, I have a personal connection to it. And also over the years, I've always enjoyed my uh, visits uh, to your program. Um, I, I think uh, one, of, one of the things that I love about it and I feel a good attachment to it is that um, microbiology and bacteriology have such a big presence in the Boston area. And um, I don't have to go too far to convince people that it's important to study bacteria and cell biology of bacteria, especially. So I'm going to tell you about some of the latest work that we've done uh, on bacterial organelles. And it really is going to have two parts to it. One part is essentially, hopefully demonstrating to you, you know, the deliberate process of studying the same organism model system, developing tools for it over a long period of time. What are some of the things that you can do eventually with that? And then I'm gonna end with how we've started to kind of now expand into a new area, which makes the argument that we shouldn't maybe limit ourselves using model organisms, especially as microbiologists, given the vast amount of uh, tools that are now available for us to explore diversity of microbes. And so if you maybe picked it up a little bit from the introduction, my kind of fascination has always been with cell biology. This is really what led me to UCSF for my graduate work. This is sort of the, some of the, the aha moments I had as an undergrad at MIT, sitting in classrooms and just seeing that, you know, a cell is such a complicated place, not because of all the things that it can do. Of course, that's really interesting. You know, the, in the realm of molecular biology, that's, that's, biochemistry is very fascinating. But for me, it was 
the the fact that it had to be an organized space. And what does that organization mean? You know, if I was sitting in the classroom listening to the lecture, and I imagined that that classroom was a cell, well, you know, the seats had to be arranged a certain way, the blackboards had to be arranged a certain way. You know, where where uh, you come in, where you get out. Uh, when people can go in and out of the classroom, all those things are somehow scheduled and arranged and, and uh, there's a plan for it. And also then, you know, they can change, you know, maybe, maybe you have to go from a blackboard to a whiteboard or put in a projector for doing PowerPoint presentations. And so the cell is really doing all those same things. It's a complicated space. Things have to be in a certain place. Uh, you have to be able to rearrange maybe in changing conditions. And that really fascinated me. And of course, you could only study that in eukaryotic cells because you see EM electron microscope images like this, where it's just a really complicated space full of organelles. Uh, you see like essentially just the edge of the nucleus here. You have all of these vesicles in there. You have the mitochondria. And uh, at UCSF, as I was studying this process in the simplest place possible, which was yeast, we were just told that bacteria don't have organelles at all. Um, so that essentially meant you can't really study cell biology in bacteria, especially if you were interested in organelles. And you know, this is the very simple message that I got. Uh, eukaryotes are complex, they have organelles. In fact, organelles are one of the defining features of eukaryotes, which as, the time, as time has gone on in, in science, it's kind of morphed the definition to not only say, eukaryotes have organelles, but that organelles can only be in eukaryotes, right? And that bacteria are simple bags of enzymes. I think a lot of you in the audience, especially in this community, I know, uh, are use this as a, as a way of saying like how bacteria are disrespected. And it's a lot more complicated than this. There's a lot going on in there. But bacteria do have organelles. Um, if I kind of go with my like gut feeling of what should be an organelle and I just look at even images of bacteria from a long time ago. So like the one in the top left here is Rhodosumon pseudomonas palustris from 1967. We see that there's actually complex membrane structures inside of the cell. And these uh, membrane structures have a unique protein content. It's the photosynthetic complexes and it allows the bacterium to have a function that it could, it could not have had if it doesn't have the organelle. And on the other side, we have cyanobacteria. And again, you see these really amazingly complex membrane structures inside of the cell. And there's also other types of organelles in uh, some of these bacteria. Uh, it kind of gets us to the point where we're looking at them and I wanna say these are organelles, but at the same time, the definition says bacteria don't have organelles. So let's, we, we trace the history and we try to think about, forget about the history, let's just look at the eukaryotes and see what is called an organelle in the eukaryotic cell. And you can see that all kinds of structures that are maybe either uh, based on a structural definition, what's limiting them, is it a membrane, is it a lipid membrane, is there no membrane at all, um, how they're related to each other evolutionarily, you know, are they all using the same systems for remodeling or not, um, the, the definitions can, can vary pretty widely. So if we want to actually look at bacteria and study organelles, we kind of need to have a definition for it. And so uh, we've made a very simple definition. In a second, I'll tell you why I like the simple definition. And the definition is that some membrane bounded structure that has a unique protein content, right? And this uh, combination of having a membrane and a protein content allows you to have the proper conditions for biochemical reactions to happen, a unique biochemical reaction, which is really one of the ways that organelles give the cell an advantage is that you can concentrate materials, you can concentrate components to do something new. And also a lot of times those materials and components can be the intermediates or even the final products can be pretty toxic. So a membrane allows you to sequester the reaction and the product too, right? So th these are the reasons why organelles are important. And the reason I picked this very simple one, and in my mind, because of my own history, I don't mean to really like limit how you think about it, but I'm gonna just limit it to lipid bounded organelles for now. So then when I say membrane here, I mean a lipid membrane. This definition allows me to ask a lot of questions that you would also ask if you study organelles in any other organism, right? How are the membranes sculpted to have a certain shape to it? These are, you know, even though they kind of look similar, they're actually two very different architectures for membranes and, and they're organized differently. How are uh, proteins sorted? If we say that you need to have a unique protein content, then somehow you need to get those proteins there. And especially if we're talking about a lipid membrane, maybe 
you have different, you know, you have lipid bounded, lipid uh, um, proteins with the membrane domain, transmembrane domain, and ones that don't. So how do they get there? And then how are they segregated to once cells are divided? If it's really important, then we think that the daughter cells should have uh, organelles also. How are the organelles segregated? And then there's a lot of related questions. You know, uh, uh, is the size control dynamically changing over time or in response to certain conditions? Are the numbers somehow regulated? Where they are in the cell, is that regulated? So with that simple definition, now I can just think about cell biology. And all of these put together also allow me to study function, okay? But to be honest, when I first started studying this, because I was purely a cell biologist, I really cared only about these types of questions that are listed here. So these are the, the ways that cell biologists think about it. And I don't want to get too much into sort of like uh, philosophy of how we do science, but sometimes I get the question of like, why do you even care? Like one just call them compartments or granules or inclusions. Part of the reason I call them organelles is because I want to have that community that thinks about problems a certain way also engaged with this problem, right? So if I just wanted to know um, how photosynthesis happens, maybe I wouldn't ask some of the questions that are here and I would just study the biochemistry of that process, right? Okay, so how do we study this? Well, the model system, as mentioned, uh, we study magnetotactic bacteria. Uh, it, you know, this is for you, this should, it should be a sense of local pride because the world really found out about magnetotactic bacteria once they were discovered uh, almost 50 years ago at Woods, at Woods Hole uh, by Dick Blakemore. So I think 1973 or 74. Uh, and these are organisms that can actually align to magnetic fields and navigate along magnetic fields. Uh, we think in the environment, like at Woods Hole, um, it allows them to find the low oxygen environments that are near the sediments more easily. There are many, in many places, not just Woods Hole, I, almost anywhere that you go, any aquatic environment, you will find magnetotactic bacteria. And that also uh, is very important because uh, for people who care about geochemistry and uh, um, uh, other related fields, this is uh, now people are, as, as we're understanding the diversity and the numbers of these bacteria in the environment, we're thinking that there might actually be a significant sink for iron. And in some environments, they might even be limiting iron access for other organisms. And we study it because we really wanna figure out how organelles are made in bacteria and how biominerals are made. So just to prove to you that this is ubiquitous, I, I, this is from a creek that's on the Berkeley campus. I've taken a sample here and uh, I'm looking at the edge of a water drop. What you don't see is that next to the microscope stage, there's a magnet that's giving you a north south going like this. And I'm taking this video with my iPhone here. So it'll slow down because that's the slow mode recording uh, feature on the iPhone. And so now I'm turning the magnet, right? I'm, this is turning slowly, but it's really because the video slowed down. And what you should appreciate is not only that the bacteria are turning and swimming in the other direction now, but that there's different kinds of bacteria there. So even from this creek, we have cocci, we have rod shaped bacteria. It's harder to see there's some spirilla in there. So even in this creek on at Berkeley campus, there's likely to be many different species of magnetotactic bacteria. Um, if you take some of them, like the one that we study as a model in the lab called Magnetospiral Magneticum, and you look at it using technology that's available to us now that wasn't before, now I'm talking about a while ago now, <laughs> 15, 20 years ago, uh, using whole cell cryoelectron tomography, with you know, essentially imaging the inside of the bacteria or the entire cell and then zooming on the inside with as little perturbation as possible. So near native state, we see that the bacteria actually have a lot of structures that are consistent with studying cell biology or consistent with having organelles in the definition that I gave you. And maybe even more, more than that definition. So top left here is uh, one slice of the bacteria, virtual slice through the whole cell of bacteria that were grown with iron. And on this side are bacteria that were grown without iron uh, or with very low amounts of iron. So what you can see here, the, the, the very electron dense dark particles are the magnetic particles that they use to align themselves. This is magnetite, just Fe3O4, iron oxide. It's a permanent magnet. The bacteria, you'll see a lot about this uh, later in the talk, but it's usually about 50 nanometers in size. Uh, that's the size that you find on average. Um, 
and uh, there's a membrane around them, right? And when you grow the cells without iron, that membrane is still there, okay? And what you can see is that the particles are actually made inside of that membrane. This is just zooming in on individual magnetosomes, which is the combination of the membrane with the particle is a magnetosome. And so this membrane, these are gram negative bacteria, the membrane is actually continuous with the cell membrane, right? Uh, in this organism, it kind of remains permanently as an attachment to the cell membrane or invagination. In some other magnetotactic bacteria, it actually separates, which is kind of an interesting difference. And more than that, there's a there's sort of uh, filaments that uh, surround the uh, magnetosome chain. I won't talk about this today, but we know these filaments are made by a protein that's related to eukaryotic actin uh, called MAMK, and it's this, pro this protein uh, is responsible for organizing the magnetosomes in a chain in the middle of the cell. So we have a lipid membrane. We know that's a lipid membrane. Uh, what I haven't told you here is that from the work of a lot of people, we know that there's actually a unique protein content on the magnetosomes. Uh, and cytoskeletal may not be the best word, but actin-like filaments surround and allow us to allow the chain to be organized in a proper manner in the cell, which helps in its uh, segregation to daughter cells. So all of these are good features to study if you want to study organelles in any organism. And so the first thing, you know, we have this really beautiful uh, view of the ultra structure of magnetisms and how they're organized, but we really wanted to know how magnetisms are made. And this is something that we've done mostly through genetics, essentially like using transposon mutagenesis and then uh, uh, also going in with directed deletions of candidate genes and categorizing them based on their secondary phenotype. And here, I just wanted to do something I couldn't have done if I was flying to Boston and doing this in person, standing in front of the room far away from you uh, to show you really what it looks like when we do genetics here. So I have actually, the, our simplest uh, assay is to, um, let's see if I have all my materials here for my show and tell. Oh yeah, our simplest assay is to just look at whether or not the cells are magnetic. If they make magnets, they should be magnetic. And um, when the cells grow, they kind of grow and pellet down in a tube. So this is just wild type cells. I don't know if you can really see that well. To make it easier, maybe I will change my background to not having a background. All right, is that clear now? You see the dark pellet? Those are bacteria that have just settled to the bottom of the tube. And if I take a magnet here, now you can oh, see this cool. pellet pulled to the magnet, right? But if I have a mutant that doesn't make magnets, first you can tell the cells are, the pellet is just a white color because there's no magnets in there. And, you know, I can put, I can stay like this for the rest of the talk and nothing will happen. Okay. So, this is really how we know that our, our first sort of pass at uh, identifying mutants. And then we have sort of deeper secondary screens that we go through to make the categories as you see them here. And now I have a problem where, oh, there we go. Okay, so I don't wanna go through this model too much. Just to show you that here, I've kind of highlighted what proteins we think uh, based on the mutant phenotype, and that's it, just a static image of, or, you know, whatever we do for a secondary screen of a mutant, what step we think they're involved in. But this is really not the best way to look at them. Uh, we could have uh, the process be a lot more dynamic and not capture it in this way. It could be that the magnetosome membranes form in just one step, or it could be that they grow over time. And we may not have the best tools and techniques to look at it, or at least in the first pass of trying to do large scale gen genetics. And I kind of drawn it as sort of linear path down uh, based on the mutant phenotypes, but there could be some sort of feedback that we don't capture. In that case, you know, a mutant and earlier steps will maybe prevent us from seeing the connection between all the steps. And so what I'm going to really tell you about is understanding some of these dynamics by looking at uh, uh, our mutants and even the wild type cells more closely. I'm really going to highlight the work of multiple people. Um, the most of the work it was done by uh, Elias, who was a former graduate student in the lab, 
and uh, Joanne, who's a, a postdoc in the lab. But we have a lot of help from collaborators, um, especially in imaging cells from Grant Jensen's lab and also from Ken Downing. Okay, so this really came about when Elias was trying to uh, image magnetism formation over time. He, you know, he, or, you know, as for going from no magnetisms to magnetisms, he kind of had cr created a strain where he could induce magnetism formation. But he was also looking at wild type cells and he kept telling me, you know what, the membranes, the magnetism membranes are not all the same size, which went against sort of the dominant model we had in the field. Our model in the field was that the magnetism membrane forms and then the mineral grows in there. So there's a constant size to the membrane, the mineral grows and the size of the membrane limits how big the mineral can get. But that really wasn't true, at least at a first pass. You can see here, we just have categorized how many what percent of magnetisms at different size ranges. And it goes anything from you know, 25 nanometers to maybe up to 80 nanometers. So quite a bit. And if you think about it, I'm just telling you like across the magnetosome, but if you consider the volume of the magnetosome, now we're thinking about a big difference in terms of the space that needs to be filled with iron, for example. And more than that, when you look at the magnetosomes, actually when in the small size ranges, if you were searching for magnetosomes that were empty and had no minerals in them, they were only in the small size ranges. Whereas magnetosomes that had <clears throat> minerals in them were in the uh, bigger size ranges. <clears throat> so there seemed to be a connection between size and whether or not um, a magnetosome was filled. <clears throat> So just to make sure that this isn't because some magnetosomes are just defective, we did an experiment where we grew the cells without iron. All the cells are empty magnetosomes. When we add iron, essentially all of them fill the magnetosomes with minerals. Um, and then you can measure now. You can say, I know beforehand without iron, all these magnetosomes are competent to make minerals. So now I can measure their sizes and then see what happens after I add iron. And we got the same answer that all those cells without iron are small magnetosomes. And then when you add iron, you, now you get magnetosomes that are filled that are all different sizes. So this told us that magnetosomes can grow over time and this correlated with membrane size. And so actually, if you take individual magnetosomes, measure the size of the membrane, measure the size of the crystal within it, magnetite crystal. And do a, a graph like this, you can see that there's a really good linear correlation between the size of the mineral and the size of the membrane. Okay, so we can think about it in two different ways. We can say, maybe what happens is that you have the membrane and it can kind of you know, have a stage that is a certain size. And as the mineral grows, it actually pushes against those boundaries and that physical force helps to expand the membrane or it's at least part of the equation to make the membrane grow. Or you can think about it that for some reason, it's really important to stay small uh, for a membrane until uh, my biomineralization has started. And so maybe there's actually more like a checkpoint where you start biomineralization and there's a signal to go to the second step of membrane growth. And so we had a mutant in a very late stage of biomineralization. This mutant makes small crystals. So we can look at what happens in that mutant that never makes big crystals that push against the membranes. And what happens is that the membranes still grow in this mutant, right? So at least in this mutant, we can say that membranes can grow and that correlation between empty membrane size and one that has a crystal and it still holds. And so it can't be that the crystals are physically pushing and expanding the membrane. So then uh, we can at least make a hypothesis that there is something in here at, around this size of a membrane that says it's okay to go ahead and grow to the next step being becoming a bigger membrane. So what is that thing? And that's where Joanne came in. And Elias and Joanne kind of had hypothesized that the function of this checkpoint might be to ensure that membranes are small so you can accumulate enough iron, you know, to reach super saturation levels to make a crystal. This is kind of like, you know, biomineralization in this case is very similar to that, those things that you might have done as a kid where you try to, I don't know, make those like little crystals on a string in solution, or, you know, if your favorite buffer things start crashing out of it, salts start crashing out of it. It's the same idea, right? You have to concentrate enough iron to be able to then initiate biomineralization. Once you have that nucleus of a crystal, now it can grow uh, to be bigger. And so the difference, Two-fold difference in diameter is really like an eight-fold difference in volume, 
more or less. So that is a lot harder maybe to fill with enough iron to initiate biomineralization. That's at least our thought. And this is consistent with a lot of other systems that do biomineralization where the size of the membrane is regulated. So um, we thought that maybe then some of the mutants that we have like this, in the past, we've looked at mutants that have small crystals or they don't make uh, any crystals at all. Maybe some of these mutants are actually not really biomineralization, direct biomineralization mutants. They're not controlling the addition of iron to the crystal or the chemistry of iron inside of the magnetosome. They're actually controlling the size of the membrane. And if it's misregulated somehow, we end up with a small crystal. So why don't we look through all these mutants that we have and see what happens? And this has brought us to uh, one very important player that I'm going to focus on for, for the next few slides. Uh, these, there are two proteins that we've known for a while are quite important in making magnetosomes. They're called MAM-E and MAM-O. All Essentially, most of the important magnetism proteins are all together in one genomic region. And in fact, the most important set is together in one large operon, and MAM-E and MAM-O are both in there. They're both proteins that we know are on the magnetosome membrane as well. But they're, they're also two of the ones that have the clearest homology to things that have, we know have an enzymatic function. So they're both like the DEG proteases that I'm sure some of you study in E. coli or other organisms. Uh, so they're part of this high temperature regulation, high temperature response family of proteases. They have, you know, uh, for MAMI, for example, it has a transmembrane domain, it has this trypsin-like domain. Uh, they're both serum proteases or look like they're serum proteases. Uh, and uh, MAMI has two PDZ domains. And MAMI is also really interesting because it has this heme binding site. There's a very unique heme binding domain in proteins, magnetosome proteins that are now called magnetochrome domains. So a few magnetosome proteins have this very unique heme binding domain. And MAMO is kind of like a DEG protease. It has a trypsin-like domain, but it has this thing at the end of it called tau E that looks like a transporter. So it's like a protease with a transmembrane domain and then like seven transmembrane domains uh, of something else attached to it. And initially, uh, Anna, who, Anna Quinlan, who was a graduate student in the lab, at the time that she started this work, we could really only do genetics and nothing else uh, with these organisms. So she just went ahead and mutated the, um, the um, active site, the very well-conserved active site on these proteins. And she showed that at least for MAM-E, uh, when uh, you mutate the, the protein, it's still sort of stable and in the cell if you mutate the active site. But now the cells don't make magnets, or at least I'll show you later what the phenotype actually is. They don't, uh, they're not able uh, to turn in the magnetic field anymore. This bar graph here, I won't go through it, but this is really measuring how well cells can turn in the magnetic field. One is uh, not, not able at all to turn in a magnetic field. And anything above that means that some proportion of the cells are, are able to align in magnetic fields. So the protease site uh, of MAM-E is important for um, uh, its activity. We know that, and it's important for the cells to be able to make uh, magnetosomes, at least big enough magnetosome, magnetite crystals that can allow the cells to align in magnetic fields. Um, I'll show you later that they actually do make small crystals. So uh, the another really important person in this uh, work is David Hershey, who has now just started his own lab at Madison. But when he was a grad student in the lab, he would love biochemistry. And, and he was like, these are the only proteins I can do biochemistry with. And he did a lot of really pioneering work to break open uh, the function of these two proteins. So first of all, he actually showed that uh, uh, MAM-E and MAM-O have a really interesting relationship with each other. And he was able to show that uh, MAM-E is a protease that uh, uh, has multiple substrates, including itself, uh, which makes things complicated. Uh, but one of his uh, substrates is a protein called MAM-P. So here we're just looking at Western blots of wild type and mutants uh, using anti-MAM-P antibodies. And you can see here, if we have a MAM-P deletion, we don't pick up anything there. But in wild type, we have a full length MAM-P and we have the sort of evidence of proteolysis uh, with this fragment of MAM-P. If we have a MAM-E deletion, we don't see that proteolytic fragment anymore. Uh, and uh, also, you know, you can complement this deletion with the wild type, 
where you get proteolysis. If you put in the protease dead version of MAM-E, you don't get proteolysis. And what was interesting was that it looks like MAM-O regulates MAM-E protease activity because when MAM-O is not around, uh, you actually don't get proteolytic activity of, on, on MAM-P and many other proteins. And also the protease, the, what looks like a protease site on MAM-O is really not a, a protease active site at all. You mutate it and there's no change in cleavage of other uh, proteins. Uh, he was able to actually get a crystal, show this actually, show this relationship in vitro using purified proteins. So we know it's a direct proteolysis of MAMP by MAMI. And he was able to um, uh, crystallize the, what looks like a protease domain on MAMO and show that it actually is not a protease domain anymore. Many, we don't know how long ago it changed. So it's no longer an active protease. And in fact, it binds metals. So MAMO is a protein that is really bifunctional. One part of it binds metals. We know that for sure. And we think that metal binding is required for biomineralization. And another part of it activates the MAM-E protease. So these two domains, we think maybe this transporter domain is more related to the MAM-E activation. And what was a protease domain is now just a metal binding domain. Okay, so this is a relationship between MAM-E and MAM-O. And this is uh, where Joanne came in and Joanne was interested in looking at all these mutants that somehow have something to do with uh, uh, the MAM-E protease and seeing if they're involved in membrane formation. And so how do we do this? We actually do whole cell cryo-electron tomography uh, to be able to measure magnetisms. That's the only way we can see magnetism membranes is by doing whole cell cryo-electron tomography. And we've tried many things over the years. This is basically, uh, we're giving the bacteria a CT scan, but we're using an electron microscope to do it. We're just taking cells, whole cells in, in, in uh, culture, putting a drop in an EM grid, freezing it, and then imaging that grid at many angles relative to the electron beam. And then all of those different angles with their projections, 2D projections of 3D objects at different angles are assembled into a 3D reconstruction. So this is just one cell reconstruction, we're going up and down through the cell. And I think the video is not gonna play all the way through for some reason, but you wouldn't have seen much except that there are empty membranes in there. And now what we can do is for each membrane, and it looks like my computer is stuck. Oh, there we go. It wants to go through this multiple times. For each one, we find the exact middle of the magnetosome because we can go through up and down in the, in the cell and find where is the exact middle. And at the exact middle, we take three different lines through it to measure the diameter and the average of those three lines for that one magnetosome is the average size of that magnetosome. But of course you have to do that for many magnetosomes. And this is the hard work that Joanne did. And what she, she was able to show was that if we look at the empty magnetosomes, which are already smaller, the MAM-E protease dead mutant makes even smaller magnetosome membranes. And the MAM-O mutant, where the lesion of MAM-O means there is no MAM-E protease activity, you have a wild type full length MAM-E, but it's not active uh, as a protease, also has smaller membranes. And by going through our mutants, she actually discovered another regulator of MAM-E protease activity, a protein called MAM-M. First, she noticed that it makes small magnetosomes, and then she went and did the biochemistry and showed that in fact, in that mutant also, the MAM-E protease is not active. So in three different ways, we know that if you disrupt MAM-E protease activity, magnetism membranes are small. This actually solves a mystery that we had in the past. When Anna had looked at the MAM-E protease mutant and done an experiment where cells go from no iron to iron added, over time, you could see that at the very beginning, uh, an hour after adding iron, the wild type and the protease mutant look the same. They make crystals at the same rate. They're the same size. But then after that, the wild type continues growing crystals, they get bigger, but in the protease, MAMI protease mutant, they don't get bigger anymore. And we thought this has something to do with the biochemistry of how minerals are made, but now we know it's because the MAMI protease mutant just has small membranes. That's the biggest the crystals can get. There's no more room for them to get any bigger, right? So really this is a phenotype that uh, the product is affected, but I think of it more as a problem of cell biology. Okay, so MAM-E, we have this weird model now, maybe that there's some scaffold that's holding the membranes together or some protein that needs to get processed by these MAM-E scissors here 
to be able to grow the membrane bigger. So what are those uh, proteins that are uh, that need to be processed? And this was a project of, a, of another graduate student, Patrick Brown, and uh, he decided to see, can I see this difference in uh, what is a MAM-E uh, related um, substrate on magnetosomes in this sort of relevant context? So he thought, if I take wild type magnetosomes, and if I take uh, magnetosomes from ME protease that anything that's processed directly or indirectly because of MAM-E activity will be full length on the protease stead magnetosomes, but it'll be processed on the wild type magnetism. So if I compare using proteomics, maybe I can find uh, some of those substrates. And he in fact found at least one. So he purifies, he had to really develop a better purification method for us to get our magnetosome protein signal high enough to be able to see the difference between these two sets of magnetosomes. And one protein in particular really stood out to us. This is a protein called MAM-D. MAM-D has been isolated, has been flagged for uh, many, many years because it's a, a class of proteins that are unique to magnetotactic bacteria, and they seem to bind to the crystal very tightly. They were actually identified through sort of sequential purification of magnetosomes, and there was just three or four proteins that bind to the crystal tightly. Some of them in vitro seem to control even biomineralization. So this is for people interested in materials, these proteins are really important for kind of mimicking uh, crystal synthesis in vitro. And uh, he really wanted to make sure that MAM-E is coming out of this uh, assay. It actually is processed by, MAM-D is actually processed by MAM-E. He um, made some recombinant versions of segments of MAMD and raised anti-MAMD antibodies. And there's background here. These upper and lower bands are nonspecific, but we can see the full length MAMD band in the wild type and we can see the processed form. And uh, we can uh, see that in the MAMD delete, uh, you don't have the processed form. And in fact, the full length seems to be uh, higher quantity than the wild type. And those bands are not present in the MAMD deletion. Uh, so Joanne continued this work. She looked at the delta MAM M, delta MAM O, where MAM E protease activity is affected, and we don't see pr proteolysis of MAM D anymore. And the same thing if we have the protease mutant of MAM E, we don't see that uh, lower band anymore. So we think that MAM E is actually um, cutting MAM D. And we showed this in vitro as well. We have a segment of MAM D that we can uh, purify. This is the part of MAM. D that is inside of the magnetosome. And if we purify that with, with an MVP tag, in vitro, we can see that proteolysis happens only if we add wild type MAM-E protease, recombinant again. If we add a protease dead version of MAM-E, the full length MAM-D is not proteolyzed. Okay, so there is cutting of MAM-D by MAM-E. Now, what you really want is to show that uh, or what we really hope is to be able to show that if somehow MAMD isn't cut, if it's a target for membrane growth, as we suspected, if MAMD somehow is not cut, then membranes are stalled at their small size because MAME, the protease, controls the proteolysis of many things. So when we have that protease mutant, we're looking at many substrates that are not proteolyzed. This was really challenging. We've done so many different things to get a mutant of MAMD does not cut, but we haven't been able to get there yet. And it just was random chance that we were able to discover an uncleavable MAMD. We were just trying to tag the protein at either end. This is while we were waiting for antibodies to come in. Uh, and we just still wanted to, to look at it uh, using Western blots. And it just turned out that if we have the flag on the end terminus, when we put this uh, on a plasmid in wild type cells, it has a severe dominant effect where the, there's no, essentially no minerals made anymore in the cells. They, they completely lose their magnetic response. It is the only over the 20 something years, 20 years almost exactly that I've been working on this problem uh, with hundreds of mutants that we've made in different ways. This is the only mutant ever in our whole field where an altered version of a protein has such a severe dominant effect. It's almost like deleting the entire magnetosome, set of magnetosome genes, just putting in this flag MAMD. But the flag tag uh, on the C terminus has no impact at all on biomineralization. And it's a little bit hard to see here, but when we put in this flag MAMD, 
uh, what you're seeing is that there's a severe reduction in proteolysis of the wild type of MAMD in vivo. So it somehow inhibits proteolysis of MAMD. And I wouldn't tell you all this if it wasn't important. We think that perhaps now we have an uncleavable MAMD, which would be the same essentially for MAMD. It's from MAMD's perspective, it's the same as having a MAM E protease dead. And now this uncleavable MAMD make we see that it has very small membranes. Okay. Uh, almost the same as the uh, MAM E protease dead. So if we have an uncleavable MAMD, now we see that. And um, this is not so important here, but I'll go through it anyway. But the presence of MAMD, we just can tell is correlated with size. So now if we delete MAMD, right, magnetisms get a little bit bigger. So if there's no MAMD around, magnetisms get a little bit bigger. If MAMD is not cleavable, magnetisms are significantly smaller. This is not as dramatic an effect maybe as I had uh, thought you would get with deletion of MAMD, which makes us suspect that it's not the only player involved in this. And in fact, there's multiple proteins that are similar to MAMD. So we would have to make a deletion of many genes in one strain to be able to see that, I think. But at least there's still a correlation. So this is the model we have now. MAMD is on the magnetosomes. We know it interacts with the mineral. So maybe that's a way that you can actually correlate the formation of the mineral to now having to cleave the protein to go to the second step. And then the cleavage uh, by MAM-E allows the membrane formation to progress to the next step. Okay, so we are interested in organelle biology and bacteria. So I'm gonna actually end studying our really great model system that allowed us over many years with the work of grad students and postdocs to go from only being able to make, make deletions in the organism to now go uh, to, you know, uh, looking at cleavage of a specific protein that might control the growth of the membrane. I'm gonna have a little departure to talk about diversity of magnetotactic bacteria and maybe studying other model systems. And the last time I was at MSI, a few people asked me, why would you wanna have another model system? You already are working, things are so great in magnetospirulum. They weren't discouraging me from doing it. They just wanted to know why. So I hope that I can show you why it's important. And it was, it turns out to be important for a very surprising way. So this diversity of magnetotactic bacteria is fascinating because the is it's, uh, comes at multiple levels. One that you can't see on this image, this phylogenetic diversity. So magnetotactic bacteria are found within all branches of the proteobacteria and then phyla outside of the proteobacteria. That phylogenetic diversity correlates also with phenotypic di diversity. This image alone can tell you that the crystals can be different shapes. They can come in different numbers. The arrangement in the cell is different. And originally we'd hoped that by studying one model, we could kind of get an idea of what these other things look like. Most of these are uncultured. However, we have been pretty lucky in our field, not just lucky, we've had some really good people working on this. There's an incredible amount of genomic data so now what we know is that all of these magnetotactic bacteria will have a, some version of these magnetosome genes I've been talking to you about. In fact, every one of these will have MAM-E. Uh, so there's about eight or nine magnetosome genes that are in all magnetotactic bacteria. But everything I've done studying or we've done studying magnetospirulum, none of it can help us understand why it is that these bacteria have different shaped crystals, for example. Because all of the proteins that control crystal size in magnetospirulum are unique to magnetospirulum. They don't even have distant homologs in these other bacteria. So I can't tell you why the crystal shape is so different here. That means I have to go and study it directly in that organism. There is no other way. So that's one reason for doing that. And so the Sophilibria magneticus is a model that we chose. Um, it is separated from magnetospirulum by maybe something like 3 billion years of evolution. And uh, the, but it still uses some of the same proteins to make magnetosomes. The, the simple experiment we did to begin with to study the process of how you would make a tooth-shaped crystal rather than a more symmetric crystal is to grow the cells without iron, add iron, and image the cells. And we got a surprise here. What we saw, which is completely different than anything in magnetospirulum, is that early time points after adding iron, the cells are filled with amorphous particles that we know have iron in them. They're not crystalline, they're rich in iron and phosphorus. And then later on, you have this sort of mixed phase where you have both the crystals that are magnetic, they're magnetite, 
and are in a chain and you had these amorphous particles. And eventually after adapting to being in iron rich conditions, they only have the magnetite. So we thought these were precursors to making magnetite. I won't tell you all the experiments we did and we're about to just completely shift from talking about magnets to talking about something completely different. It turns out this iron here never makes it to the magnetic particles. It is not at all related to magnetosomes, right? So we've called these uh, inclusions that have a membrane around them. We call them ferrosomes now for iron bodies. And we are interested in how they're formed and what they do. This is the project that Carly Grant took on. She was a graduate student in the lab and she's continued on as a postdoc. Uh, she's part of the Baker Fellowship. And Carly is actually the one who named them ferrosomes as she, she wanted to have a name for the things that she was studying. So um, what she did was she enriched, she purified them or enriched for them and just did mass spec. And she saw that magnetosome proteins are not associated with this enriched fraction. If she purified magnetosomes, she would see the magnetosome proteins. But the fer this ferrosomes have other proteins on them. And three of the proteins enriched here, these DMR28330, 340, um, they have numbers that are really close to each other because these are sequential genes that are in an operon together or what looks like an operon. So this was a good clue that maybe they're involved in a similar process. They're associated to ferrosomes, the proteins. The genes are together what, in what looks like an operon. And one of the proteins, what we call uh, FESB, is a, a P-type ATPase. These are pretty broadly conserved transporters. Uh, and the specific class that FESB um, uh, is most similar to, they're, they're known to be involved in metal transport. And in fact, in many bacteria, these transporters, this specific class of transporters is used to deal with metal toxicity in the cells, just pumping out metals if there's too much of them. So Carly actually developed along with uh, Lila Ron Lee, who was a postdoc in the lab. And Lila was a former member of your community in Rich Low Six Lab as a graduate student. They made uh, a genetic system for desulfovibrio, which was actually a multi-year effort. And they were able to, Carly was able to use that system to delete some of the FES genes. And what she sees if the operon essentially is, most of it is gone, is that in the middle panel, you can see here, you don't make ferrosomes anymore. You can complement it and make ferrosomes again, but when the operon is gone, you still make magnetosomes. So we know that these two are genetically different systems. And in fact, if you look at FESB, FESB is spread across the bacterial tree. Even in some archaea, you have FESB and what look like FES operons. And uh, most magnetotactic bacteria don't have ferrosomes, but some do but many other types of bacteria, including many bacteria that are associated with hosts like gut microbes, dental microbes, and a lot of free living bacteria, uh, all of which seem to have an anaerobic part of their life cycle, have a FES operon. So we thought, does having a FES operon mean that you make ferrosomes? And, and because so many bacteria have the FES operons, we're able to choose ones that are genetically tractable to study. So we, Carly basically has a little farm of bacteria in the lab. And one of the ones that she chose was uh, Schuonella petrophations. It has a FES operon. Now, if you look at it by EM, it makes little particles. And Terry Beveridge's group many years ago had shown that there are intracellular iron particles made in this organism, this Schuonella, but not other Schuonella species. This is the only one that has the FES operon. We delete the FES operon. We no longer make these particles. Okay. So... What do they do? This has been much more difficult to study because if we think of it as an iron storage system or dealing with iron toxicity, a lot of these bacteria have multiple different systems for that. But we have seen a phenotype that is actually kind of similar in its magnitude to what uh, other iron system storage systems do in bacteria. We've seen a phenotype where after iron or during iron starvation, as cells are coming, uh, grow, getting into stationary phase, the lag phase length of lag phase is longer when cells are starved for iron and when they're missing iron storage systems so they don't have a prior reservoir of iron during iron starvation the lag phase is even longer and we see that with the delta fez the lag phase is longer complementation of it sometimes makes the lag phase shorter because we think it's overproduced and we've done this by adding edta uh, to limit iron just to show you we have edta if we add iron again 
to the on top of the EDTA, we can reverse the lag phase difference. So we think it's very specific this phenotype to um, iron starvation. So we think it has something to do with just having a reservoir of iron under anaerobic conditions. This phenotype is not there under aerobic conditions, which is really interesting. And we can take the Fez operon from Chuanella, put it in E. coli, and now those five or six genes from Chuanella are completely sufficient for E. coli to make ferrosomes. You can see the particles by EM. Now we've done some elemental analysis to show that this is actually iron in here. Uh, we've actually also taken the Fez operon from a different organism, put it into magnetosperlum, and now magnetosperlum makes both magnetosomes and ferrosomes, right? So we think this is sort of the way that ferrosomes are made, that cells have all these transporters part of this uh, ATP type ATPase family. Normally they sit at the cell membrane and pump things out, but the Fez operon either through uh, the action of the transporter itself or some of the accessory proteins can form a vesicle in the cell the same directionality of transport will now fill these membranes uh, with the metal. Okay, so what I want you to take away from here is that bacteria have organelles. This is so, you know, you can do a well actually now if somebody says bacteria don't have organelles. Well, actually they do have organelles and I can tell you at least about two of them. So magnetosomes use membranes to produce minerals and uh, ferrosomes, we think are much more widespread than magnetosomes in nature. In fact, we think we've only discovered the iron storage version of ferrosomes because when we look at the phylogenetic tree, there are other things that look like ferrosome operons that the transporter looks slightly different. So it might be that versions of ferrosomes exist that transport other types of metals. And this is where that Baker Fellowship comes in. You might imagine how that would work. How many other unknown organelles are out there? I have no idea. This is what I just told you. There's a lot of different ferrosome operons out there. There's a lot of different mineral bacteria that have mineral inclusions that have different types of materials in them, nickel, silver, other things. And using this technology that we have now, uh, cryo-electron tomography, this is work from Grant Jensen's lab. They're just saying, look, we've been, we've been helping people image bacteria and a lot of bacteria have a lot of weird things inside of them. Maybe this just artifacts, but maybe it's real. Maybe there's something to all these compartments that we could never see before because you need the kind of uh, high uh, resolution imaging and material preservation, the cellular materials preserved using the uh, using whole cell cryo-electron tomography. So maybe there's other organelles out there and I encourage you to think about that as you go through your careers. Maybe this is a good thing for you to, to take on in the future. This is the lab uh, that's done most of this work and uh, many of our collaborators and people important for this work are highlighted on this slide. I'm happy to answer questions. I know I went a little bit longer, but uh, I also can stay after 10 o'clock if there are more questions or one o'clock for you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This is really, really illuminating. I'll invite anyone who has a question to go ahead and put it in the Q&A or to uh, raise their hand and you can ask it directly. Let's see, I've got one coming in here and for some reason I'm having trouble pulling it down on my screen. <laughs> oh, is it because I've clicked on it? No, no, it's not oh. you. Can you see it though? Go yeah. for it. So um, uh, Hua Liang, I, I hope I pronounced that Correctly, you mentioned ferric malate was used for magnetism ferrosome formation. Have you tried other iron source? No, uh, the, the malate is, is just there for us to be able to, to chelate the iron and so we can add it to the solution. For uh, magnetosomes, you can add ferrous iron, you can add ferric iron, you can have it chelated with different things and they can make magnetosomes regardless. Um, I think it's because it's just, the it's not the, the for magnetosomes for sure iron has to be transformed to ferrous state before it's brought into the magnetosome we think at least um, to make magnetite magnetite in fact is a mixed valent mineral so it has both ferric and ferrous iron in it so you'll have to change the iron in one way or another regardless of the source and ferrosomes i think we've only tried ferric but um yeah I don't really know for fer for ferrosomes. Actually, you know what? What I can tell you for ferrosomes is that uh, Terry Beveridge's group, and we have repeated this too, 
they, they in fact first saw this by um, uh, using, you know, sh growing Schuonella on, on um, iron minerals, on ferrihydrite. So we know for at least two different types of iron, uh, you, can, uh, you can actually have uh, ferrosomes formed. Hmm. So, okay, second anonymous attendee, do you find that there is an increase in fatty acid synthesis? We haven't looked at that during formation of magnesium. We haven't looked at that directly. I have some really preliminary data that I don't necessarily feel comfortable sharing, but, but okay, fine, I'll kind of say it, but <laughs> we, we've been using TNC, which came out of actually inspired by my last visit to MSI to, to take that on, seeing, um, especially with David Rudner, he really encouraged me to, to think about doing that in magnesium. We've been looking at doing TNC in a couple of different scenarios, one of which is to investigate um, potentially the function of magnetosomes, what they do for the cell by looking at whether or not other genes now become essential if you don't have magnetosomes around. So, you know, mm. are there some stresses that cells go through? And in the process, we've actually discovered that the opposite also is really interesting. Are there certain things that are essential for cell survival if you're making magnetosomes, which is something I had never considered, mm. silly enough. But yeah, there are some genes that come up that seem to be involved in uh, lipid metabolism, which might have to do either with increased need for lipid production or for needing to, to be able to have membranes at these weird architectures that if you're making magnetosomes, you need to have a different aspect to your lipid metabolism. But I really can't go beyond that because we haven't, we've just uh, stumbled on this. Great. How, so, what's the yeah. final size of the magnetosome so they don't grow indefinitely? I have no idea. We have some mutants where the membranes are bigger, but beyond that, I don't really know. How challenging was the ferrosome isolation purification? Well, we're just enriching for ferrosomes. So that, and at that level, it's not all that challenging. Uh, uh, if you have like a sucrose cushion, the ferrosomes go to the bottom. Most of the other cellular material doesn't. Uh, so since we're just, you know, it, it's enriched, but I, I wouldn't say they're uh, highly, it's, a, it's not a highly pure fraction. Hmm. Okay, so what would happen if you cultivate a magnetic active bacteria in an environment where nutrients are available in one region of the medium and the magnet is set to attract cells to the opposite side? How would cells evolve in this situation? Um, are you, I think the question is asking whether or not, by nutrients, do you mean iron? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the question is asking. I, I'd be happy to, if you can ask it live. Uh, yeah, Andreas, feel free to, let's see here. If you'd like to, you're, you're invited to, and you should be able to talk here. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, thanks. I was just wondering nutrients that are really necessary for survival. Somehow I was thinking about a sort of competition between, you know, being attracted to one side and having to feed on the other side, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying that like, if, if they need to go to the other side, but they can't because they're forced to the low nutrient side with the magnet, is that the question? What happens? Um, I can tell you one thing that will definitely yes, happen. Uh, more or less. Yeah, one thing that will definitely happen is that you will have uh, mutants that don't make magnetosomes and they'll end up on the low nutrient side because with a strong magnet, the cells are gonna be stuck on the magnet side. Any cell that, and, and this happens actually, um, the entire magnetosome island region, which is about hundred kilobases is, is flanked by one kilobase direct repeats. and at a relatively, well, at a, at a low rate, but you know, significant enough in a tube of bacteria, uh, there will be recombination and mutants that lose the entire magnetism island. Um, and they, they will then, those mutants will be the ones that, if, if having the nutrients is required for survival, you'll start seeing those mutants uh, increase in the, in the nutrient side of the tube because they can then be freed from the magnet. Otherwise, they can't escape the magnet. Hmm. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question, thank you. Considering bacteria to be well-mixed systems tends to be a good approximation when modeling their dynamics. 
other than biomineralization, do you think there are other roles organelles in bacteria that we have missed so far? Um, I, I think, you know, for sh that, that is definitely true. There are other roles. So uh, even with ferrosomes, I don't think necessarily it's biomineralization. Um, I, I had one time at a conference, biomineralization conference, I, I, I talked about ferrosomes and then later on, a geologist corrected me saying, since, since it's not crystalline, it's not a mineral. But then another geologist told me, no, that he's not right. It actually is. <laughs> so I don't know if it's actually biomineralization in this case, uh, in the sense that you make a crystal, it might just be a reservoir to use it later. So then it's storage. That's another role, possibly. Other roles are, for example, if you take things like carboxysomes, the, those roles, the, 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 they are uh, potentially protect creating an environment to, to concentrate uh, the, the uh, components of a reaction that is pretty inefficient on its own. Um, for photosynthetic membranes, the thought is that it increases the surface area available for photosynthesis because that's where the photosynthetic proteins are. So that's again, a different type of function. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I see relatedly, I think you started to address this, but here's a question about, can I think that the organism make magnetisms for, uh, for iron stock for themselves? If so, how do they then eat or utilize the stock iron when they need to? Yeah, so magnetosomes, no, they, magnetosomes will never get used up as an iron source. Um, if you look at a magnetosome um, and then you take iron out, the individual crystals will never shrink, but over time through su successive cell divisions, you'll lose magnetosomes. So magnetosomes will never get used as a, as a source of iron. Um, they, the uh, function of magnetosomes is a little bit, I mean, I guess I would say maybe partially controversial, but maybe not really. Uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it's really a navigation tool that it allows the cells to be, well, it doesn't allow the cells, the cells are stuck in the earth's magnetic field. And then when they're searching for nutrients, like let's say oxygen, they only have this track, that's the magnetic field line of the earth to navigate. And so it ends up being more like a one dimensional search rather than a three dimensional search. And that might, that might be good, right? It's like, if you're riding on a train and you know you wanna go from one point to another point, that's better than if you were meandering around in a car and eventually making your, your way there. Hmm. Um, but maybe there's another function and the, the, and even for ferrosomes, maybe the function is for competition in these environments that they might actually be combining, navigating an environment up and down on a magnetic field, and then soaking up the iron to prevent other things from accessing iron, because these are very iron limited environments that they're in usually. Hmm. That's great. All right, we've got two more questions here and then I'll probably, I'll probably cut us off after John's, but uh, Yvonne's asking how do the size and composition change if there are perturbations in iron level or oxygen level, for example, in the environment? Yeah, thank you, Yvonne. And it's good to see you um, or see you virtually. <laughs> uh, so how does size composition change if there are perturbations in iron levels? So uh, for magnetosomes, if you really limit the iron, you will make smaller crystals, depending on the organism, like there, there's different sort of modes of magnetism formation, but in magnetosperm, the size will be smaller. It seems like they're just trying to make, they're trying to make the mineral. And if they use up all the iron, they use up all the iron, right? But they're not going to say, I'm going to wait until there's enough iron to make uh, magnetisms. Magnetisms in magnetosperm are interesting also because once I, the, the organisms are microaerophilic, so they can tolerate some level of oxygen. And there is a good range of oxygen where at least in culture in the lab, the bacteria are totally fine. They grow really happily, but they won't make any magnetic particles at all. We don't really know as a field why that is, if it's sort of something about the chemistry of iron uh, at those oxygen concentrations, which I don't think so necessarily or if it's some other thing that's related to their lifestyle, where if they are in an environment that has enough oxygen, there's no need to have magnetism. So there's a block in magnetism formation. Um, so we are think we are, especially with the TNC, we are trying to see, can we at least get some genetic clues in that relationship between oxygen and magnetism formation? Sure. That's great. 
when looking at fair zones, do you find a similar degree? And, and to just give, give a more complete answer to something before, all of these bacteria, even ones that have ferrosomes, also have other iron storage systems like ferritins, bacterial ferritins, other things called encapsulants. Sometimes a bacterial cell will have four different, very complex, macro, you know, like big macromolecular iron storage systems in the same cell. And we have no idea why or hmm. how it is that they balance the use of all these different systems. When looking at ferrosomes, do you find a similar degree of variation in size as you observe with magnetosomes? So ferrosomes are much harder to study for us right now in the way that we study magnetosomes. Um, a lot of the organisms that have ferrosomes are, are too uh, big so that we can't use cryo-electron tomography as a way of looking at the membranes. The, we are now measuring the spread of the size of the just the electron dense part, so the particle in there. And it has a range in size uh, that is in the wild type scenario, smaller than magnetosomes, but I don't think that's so by itself, it's not necessarily all that significant. We don't, I, we can't compare the two to each other, just two different things. However, one thing that's really interesting is that you can have scenarios where ferrosomes get really, really large. So uh, we had some clues in the, the sulfovibrio case that the, it's controlled by iron availability, production of ferrosomes. So the ferrosome proteins are around under iron starvation but under iron rich conditions, they're not around. And based on the genomic context, it looks like they're regulated by fur, which is the, uh, fer uh, the ferrous, up ferrous uptake regulator, I think. I'm sorry if I'm messing up the name, but it, it is a big transcription factor that senses and then controls the expression of lots of iron um, starvation related genes. So we decided to have a scenario where the cells always think they're starving for iron in terms of their transcriptional program, but there's iron around. Mm. And so uh, Carly made a fur mutant, fur deletion in the sulfur embryo, which was, take, took a long time. And now the cells, they're com almost completely filled with ferrosomes because they just, they always think they're starving for iron. So mm. they're always making ferrosomes and some of them make really giant ferrosomes. So we don't really understand how ferrosomes are controlled in terms of their size. Uh, and then we also don't know how the iron is used up or if it is used up really. Hmm. And the numbers, we have no idea how they're controlled. So these are projects in the lab now where we're using the more genetically tractable organisms to essentially look at the requirement of each gene in the operon, the localization of all the proteins, which again is very tough because these are all membrane proteins and Ferrosomes are only relevant under anaerobic conditions. So we have to kind of use, we can't use GFP. We're trying to use other tags. So it's become more complicated, but uh, I think once we have the tools in place, actually it might be an easier system to study the magnetosomes because it has many fewer parts to it than the magnetosome does. Hmm. That makes a lot of sense. We think the ferrosome is used as an iron source. How is the iron released and utilized? That's a really good question. That's something that, you know, is there another transporter in there that works the opposite way? Is the membrane dissolved and then the iron is used? Does it fuse to the cell membrane and then now it goes in the periplasm? Ferrosomes are actually really interesting. Magnetosomes are only in gram negative bacteria and it looks like magnetosome genes were ancestral. So they don't, there's some horizontal gene transfer, but really, a lot of it seems to be have been an, an ancestral to many different bacterial phyla, and it didn't move around much by horizontal gene transfer. Ferrosomes are all jumbled up in terms of like their relationship to each other. And then if you look at the housekeeping genes from the same organism, so it really has been moving around by horizontal gene transfer. I mean, we just put them in E. coli and they work. So it's not that hard to make them work in other organisms. And uh, if you, you know, we think that if you have a ferrosome operon, you can make ferrosomes. Gram positives have it. Uh, you know, in fact, essentially every C difficile, Clostridium difficile uh, uh, isolate seems to have ferrosomes. And people, if you look at sort of transcriptomic studies, ferrosome genes are expressed in C difficile under iron starvation. They're expressed when C difficile is, you know, in a model uh, animal system, so during an infection cycle. And ferrosomes are also in archaea. So I think ferrosomes okay. somehow can be made in many different contexts. How they're used might be different in different contexts. So there might be a storage in one system, but there might be detoxification 
or help with competition in another system. That's all just speculation on my part. We, mm-hmm. That's, again, you know, what we're trying to now start with ferrosomes in the lab. Awesome. So related to your comment about the, the fact that the magnetosome is only in gram negative, is it then always positioned on the inside of the inner membrane? And that yeah, seems so common? It seems common, but um, uh, so there, there is at least, uh, uh, there are at least some cases, there, there's two variations I'll tell you about. One case is another magnetosperlum that Dirk Schuler's lab has been studying for many years longer than I've been working with uh, AMB1. And they've done, you know, they're, they've done a lot of pioneering work in our field. Um, and our two groups started doing, you know, using different collaborators, doing uh, cryo-electron tomography. We would always see magnetisms in, in AMB1 as invaginations of the cell membrane. They would, they would see some of them as being separate. <clears throat> so this was one of those classic things where like, okay, why is it that we're seeing different things? And I really think it's because the two organisms are different from each other. So we've even now imaged some of their species. It's basically side by side by imaging AMB1 and we do see the same thing. So at least hmm. in a related magnetosperlum, they can separate, but they still stay close to the cell membrane. Okay. So that's one case. The second case is with RS1, where funny enough, the, I didn't really want to go get into this because RS1, I was only introducing it for, for the ferrosomes. Mm-hmm. But while we can see a membrane around ferrosomes, we don't see a membrane around the mature crystals of RS1. Interesting. How, okay. However, using genetics, this is work that Lila did, we know that membrane proteins, including those that have homologs in magnetosperlum, are required for biomineralization. So mm-hmm. a project right now in the lab, we think that what, what happens in RS1 is that the initial stages of biomineralization are inside of a membrane, and then the crystals are released somehow. That makes sense with the model you were talking about of needing to concentrate things in order to get a sufficient um, yeah. concentration to, to trigger bio, biomineralization. Yeah, and in, in that case, you know, it might be because of the shape of the crystals, which are these sort of elongated two-shaped crystals, that, that that's harder to sculpt in a membrane, but we don't really know at all. We, so mm-hmm. so this, is, this is a project in the lab right now is to just begin to even answer the, the simple question of like, are the, is there a change in the protein content of the magnetosome in RS1 as the cells go through bimineralization? Uh, and then also trying to image it again to see if we can see the membranes or not. Mm-hmm. Great, well, I will wrap us up with one question that I'm curious about from a broader educational perspective. To what extent do you think this knowledge or see that this knowledge is being disseminated in textbooks or literature that's available just in terms of the idea of organelles in prokaryotes? Yeah, so um, I think more than before, um, how are ferrosomes localized within the cell? Sorry, let me answer this last. Oh yeah, of course. How are ferrosomes localized within the cell? We don't know, I mean, it, it looks to me like I think of ferrosomes right now, this may not be the right way. And maybe later we have to change the way we think about it. Uh, I think of it as like a high copy plasmid, right? That, that it's just, there's a lot of it. It's essentially all over the cell, whatever available spaces. And so that's how it ensures that it gets segregated, but it does look more polar. And right now we don't really know how that, first of all, whether or not that's really true, that it's polar only. Uh, and then also how localization happens, but that is a very good question. Mm. Um, so yeah, how, so for a long time at the very beginning, you know, I was really stuck on this because I would say organelles all the time. And then for a while, then uh, I was like, yeah, bacteria have organelles and, you know, we've been talking about it. So why, why mention it again? So I just stopped talking about it in that way. <laughs> and then I had several encounters that made me realize that it's still a, relatively prevalent concept that mm. bacteria don't have organelles, um, including a student of mine who was, uh, who was the graduate student instructor for our introductory biology course at Berkeley. And he came to lab one day and he was like, guess what? Today in a uh, lecture, professor, I won't name the professor, said that bacteria don't have organelles. <laughs> so now I, I have to tell the, the undergrads that I'm teaching that no, actually they do. And so 
Um, I do think it's okay to say they don't have eukaryotic organelles. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. But I think maybe it's also important to examine what we mean by an organelle. And, um, and if we, you know, it is one of those topics to, to me, uh, if you say bacteria have organelles that are completely different, they evolve differently, they have no relation to eukaryotic organelles, or that there is some shared mechanism in how bacteria make organelles. Um, I think either answer is really cool. So it doesn't really matter whether or not they're the same or not. I think is really interesting. If you find other ways that organisms have been able to manipulate their membranes, maybe, you know, for example, let's say we find a domain in a ferrozone protein that allows uh, for membrane to be bent in order to make a ferrozone, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe a similar domain exists in eukaryotes. It's not used to make an organelle, but it's used in other types of membrane remodeling, right? So maybe that's one way to connect them or maybe it just doesn't exist at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe every bacterial organelle is using a different mechanism to sculpt the membrane. So all of those are cool, but I think you have to at least acknowledge that the use of the word organelle as a catch-all in eukaryotes is problematic if you don't also include organelles in bacteria that, that meet the same general definitions. Now, originally, if we trace it back, it's actually a Berkeley, we can go to a Berkeley piece of work, the scientific work, which was from Roger Stanier. They had a concept, you know, this is before phylogenetic, molecular phylogeny, so pre Carl Woese, they were wanted to categorize microorganisms. I mean, you had, if you have a really tiny thing living inside of another cell, is that a intracellular bacterium or is it a virus? Mm -hmm. Or if you have a really tiny thing, single cell that can do photosynthesis, is it a cyanobacterium or is it a eukaryotic algae? Mm -hmm. Right. So they needed a way to classify organisms and cell biology was what they chose. They're very specific about what they call like a eukaryotic organelle is something that has a membrane around it that's separate from the cell membrane and it has DNA inside of it. So they were thinking nucleus mitochondrial chloroplasts, mm -hmm. right? And that evolved in terms of scientific language to include anything that is a compartment in a eukaryotic cell. I see, okay. So since bacteria don't have mitochondria, more or less, or nuclei in the same way, or chloroplasts, maybe we can say they don't have organelles by that definition, mm -hmm. but then that would mean that we can't call the ER an organelle, we can't call lysosomes, sorry, lysosomes, we can't call a lot of other things that we consider organelles in eukaryotes as organelles by that very strict definition. Right, right. At some point, the definition also morphed in eukaryotes to include this broader, these broader classes of organelles. And yeah, then... it became this circular thing where mm -hmm. if you're, you know, you can, organelles are, are what make eukaryotes different than bacteria, but then that means that bacteria don't have organelles. So then <laughs> anything in a eukaryote is an organelle and any similar structure in a bacterium can't be an organelle. It can't be an organelle because bacteria don't have organelles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. So now we have well, what, what membraneless organelles in eukaryotes, right? That's like a really big field. There's a lot of membraneless organelles in bacteria. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is a. I feel like this is an excellent food for thought. I could definitely continue talking and chatting, and we had clearly an excellent uh, array of questions, but considering we've already taken an hour and 20 minutes of your time, I feel conscious of the fact that we should let you go. So thank you so much, Achala, so for the nomination and thank you for a really fabulous talk. It's much appreciated. Thank you to, to everyone who attended. Great questions. And hopefully in a few years, we can do this in person again. Absolutely. All right. Look forward to it. Bye-bye.